If you'll be finding your seats, we'll get started here in just a moment. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. This uh, topic is probably either going to be really enjoyable for you or it's going to so let you down based on what you thought it might be that you'll wish you hadn't stayed the afternoon. I'm not sure which. I, I will say that I've gotten probably more uh, feedback before my lecture than I ever have uh, from this title, everyone's trying to figure out what's going on and what I'm going to say and how many jokes I'm going to tell and how I'm going to work my terrible sense of puns and humor into all of this as well. Um, so there has been that element of this which has been interesting to me. And I guess the, the title, uh, Jesus' Use of Humor in His Teaching, is kind of provocative in that way. Although I will say it's not as good as the title that I wanted to use but I didn't think that I could get away with using that one, and so I had to come up with something a little bit uh, more tame and vanilla, I suppose. Well, as we get into this topic of uh, Jesus' use of humor in his teaching, I want to begin with uh, a quote from Albert Schweitzer in his very famous book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus, where Schweitzer says, each successive epic of theology found its own thoughts in Jesus. Each individual created him in accordance with his own character. There is no historical task which so reveals a man's true self as writing a life of Jesus. I think Schweitzer is absolutely right, both in terms of our tendency to find ourselves in Jesus and the tendency of that to reveal who we really are. And we're very familiar with this, right? How easy it is to create a God in one's own image. Our God likes the things that we like and hates the things that we hate. And his rules sound strangely like our preferences. And he looks like what we want him to look like. And that's true of Jesus as well. I'm sure you've all seen hippie Jesus at some point in your life. Or socialist Jesus or Republican Jesus, or Democrat Jesus, or Jesus who cheers for Tim, Tim Tebow and eats at Chick-fil-A Jesus. And we all know this guy really well, right? <laughs> Jesus looks like what we want him to look like. That happens all of the time. And it's, as I think about this problem of creating a Jesus in our own image, I'm reminded of how much I need to look at myself as I prepare for a lecture on the humor of Jesus. After all, did I pick this topic just so I could find a Jesus who tells jokes? Because I like to tell jokes. Did I bring up the idea of creating a Jesus in one's own image just so I could show you a Jesus meme? Is that all that's going on here in my head? Uh, did I select this topic just because I thought I had a really good title that I knew that I couldn't use with a hope that somehow maybe I could slip it in anyway? <laughs> well, perhaps the, the fact that I'm willing to ask these questions, as is often the case, perhaps that's evident that maybe I'm not too far gone, or maybe not. But this is a real danger of finding what we want to find in Jesus. And it's a real danger for Christians who seem very serious about things to miss an element of Jesus' life that I think is very present. For example, Niebuhr said, the Bible is virtually devoid of humor. That's a little bit of a paraphrase, but that's the upshot of it. Bergrav says the Jews of Jesus' day had no appreciation for humor. One of my professors in some of my work makes reference in an article that he wrote about the humor of Jesus to a fundamentalist pamphlet that he came across that was titled, Jesus Never Laughed. This is the Jesus that people see sometimes. And this has been a problem for a long time. Probably the most surprising thing to me as I was beginning to do research for this lecture was a couple of things that was said by the 4th century church father, as they are called, John Chrysostom. 
Chrysostom said in his homilies on Matthew, if you, we, if you also weep in this way, you are become a follower of the Lord. Yea, for he also wept, both over Lazarus and over the city, and touching Judas, he was greatly troubled. And this indeed one may often see him do, but nowhere laugh, nay, nor smile but a little. No one, at least of the evangelists, has mentioned this. And later in his homilies in Hebrews, he says, And do you, a solitary, laugh at all and relax your countenance? You that are crucified, you that are a mourner, tell me, do you laugh? Where do you hear of Christ doing this? Nowhere but that he was sad indeed oftentimes. For even when he looked on Jerusalem, he wept. And when he thought of the traitor, he was troubled. And when he was about to raise Lazarus, he wept. And do you laugh? We could talk for a long time about the problem of arguments from silence. But that aside, notice this problem. Jesus never laughed is the idea. Jesus never smiled. And fortunately, in my life, I've only known a few Christians who go this far and think that Jesus never laughed, or at least verbalize it. I've only known one or two who've told me they think it's wrong for us to laugh. That humor is a bad thing in us. And so we envision this perpetually sad and serious and, let's be honest, not terribly human Jesus so easily. I did a Google image search just to see what would come up for Jesus of Nazareth. And the vast majority of the images that returned were nothing but serious, frowning, man of sorrows images of Jesus. Famous paintings of Jesus tend to be the same thing. Bruce Longenecker was writing about this, and he was speaking about Rembrandt's, uh, the little children being brought to Jesus. And he says, if we trust Rembrandt's view of things, the one who invited the little children to come to him might not have been one to whom the little children would have run eagerly and expectantly. Can you imagine a frowning, uh, frowning, uh, frowning, scowling, angry Jesus just being this magnet for all the children and all the people. Everyone loved him because he was so angry all the time. He was so terribly depressed. It's no wonder the huge crowds came to him, right? The movie depictions of Jesus aren't any better, frequently showing him as a brooding and intense person, a person of uh, nothing but grave austerity uh, and, and somber piety. Probably the only medium that exists that shows Jesus smiling a lot is children's books. I think outside of that, you just don't see Jesus smile much in our artwork and in our, our cinema and in anything else along the lines. Is that all Jesus was? Yeah, Jesus was a man of sorrows. Yes, Jesus was a serious person. Is that all that Jesus was, though? Did, did he attract such crowds because of his ability to scowl and because he had no appreciation whatsoever for humor? We often cite what Jesus said, you came because you ate the food, and rightfully so because Jesus said that. But remember, he had to make the food because the crowd was there before they ate the food. Why were there 5,000 men plus women and children around Jesus to hear his teaching because it was so terribly monotonous and angry? No, because he was a fantastic teacher, not just what they saw or what they taught that attracted them to Jesus, but who he was and how he taught I think Elton Trueblood is right when he says anyone who reads the Synoptic Gospels with a relative freedom from, pre from presuppositions might be expected to see that Christ laughed and that he expected others to laugh. But our capacity to miss this aspect of his life is phenomenal. We are so sure that he was always deadly serious that we often twist his words in order to make them conform to our preconceived mold. A misguided piety has made us fear that acceptance of his obvious wit and humor would somehow be mildly blasphemous and sacrilegious. Religion, we think, is serious business, and serious business is incompatible with banter. So who's right, true blood or Chrysostom? It's got to be one or the other, right? Maybe somewhere in between, but did Jesus have a sense of humor or didn't he? Well, we'll come back to the PowerPoint here in just a moment, but as, as we think about this, I think it's important to think about humor in itself. Humor, I would suggest to you, is a human trait. It is something that all of us have. 
And it's about as natural of a reaction to life as there is. And it's from infancy on up. Babies laugh, and old people laugh, and everyone in between laughs at something. And it's about a variety of subjects and a variety of levels. Sometimes we laugh at something because it's truly funny and universally thought to be funny. Sometimes we're at that point where we laugh because if we don't laugh, we're going to cry. And there's a whole lot of in between that we laugh at in the midst of all of that. And the only people who don't laugh are people who either studiously avoid it because they think it's wrong somehow, or people who, and I don't say this to make light of the issue, people who are psychologically imbalanced in some way. And that's why they don't laugh. Otherwise, humor is a universal human trait. And if it's a universal human trait, you have to ask, where did it come from? And your basic options are the image of God or a result result of sin in the fallen state of humanity. And I I don't think I'm giving you a false dichotomy there. I don't think there's any in between. It either comes from God or it comes from sin. And if it comes from God, then you should expect it to be in Jesus as well. Well, How can you show that laughter comes from God, that humor comes from God? Well, I don't know if this is the definitive proof text on this, but the psalmist does tell us that he who sits in the heavens laughs. And he laughs because a bunch of human armies have decided that they're going to go overthrow God and his anointed one. And there might be a little bit of derisive laughter in that, but I think there's also a little bit of laughing at the absurd at that. Really? You think you're going to take on God and his anointed one? That's hilarious is what that is. Not just laughing at them, but laughing at the the absurdity of the entire situation. And so if humor is a human trait that comes from God, then humor can be expected to be found in Jesus and in his teachings as well. And in Jesus' teaching, he was teaching in a culture of orality and orality, which is to say hearing and listening, not in a culture of literacy, which is not to say that everyone was illiterate, but that the teaching was done in an oral sort of way. And what you need in that kind of culture is teaching that is memorable. And so they would use various structures and devices and things along those lines to make their teaching more memorable. And Jesus, though he was certainly unique in some ways, did teach according to at least some of the rhetorical conventions of his day. And we miss this very easily for a variety of reasons. We miss the humor in Jesus' teaching for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is because we have this false image of Jesus who never smiled in our mind. Or we have the false image of a Bible that's so serious it can't possibly be funny in our mind. Or because we're so familiar with Jesus' teachings that we no longer hear them fresh. And we hear them through one of these other two false lenses that Jesus never smiled or that the Bible's never funny and we're so familiar with it that we just miss it. One author said, if we did not know all of his retorts by heart, we should reckon him among the greatest wits of all time. And I think that is absolutely right. You listen to some of his exchanges with the Pharisees and if you weren't thinking Jesus is too holy to laugh or smile or you had never heard it before, you would laugh at what Jesus says in response to these people. It is funny sometimes what Jesus does. And as we get into some examples of this, which I'm gonna spend some time talking through here in in just a moment, Uh, I think I need to make at least something of a disclaimer as I get into it. First of all, although I think that one author is wrong, that the Jews of Jesus' day had no appreciation for humor, at the same time, we can't expect the, the sense of humor of first century Jews to match the sense of humor of 21st century Americans. There's some universality in, in humor and some that's not. They would laugh at things that we don't find funny. We will laugh at things that they don't find funny. And so we can't expect all of the humor to translate exactly. Secondly, to say that Jesus used humor in his teaching is not to say that Jesus was a stand-up comic. He's not just throwing jokes out right and left constantly because he wants everyone to be laughing all of the time. He used uh, humor in his teaching in a rhetorical way to make points, to make things more memorable, to, to drive the point home very often in some way or another. And the forms of humor that are used will vary in terms of how they strike you. Some things will make you laugh. I hope to give you an example of that today in a little while. Some things will make you smile. Some things will just make you nod knowingly. And there are a variety of levels in between. 
So when I say Jesus used humor in his teaching, I'm not saying that you're just going to be cackling all the way through the Gospels. That's not what I'm trying to get to today. So what are some examples of humor in the teaching of Jesus? Well, we have limited time, and I want to give you a variety of different things than kind of focus on one story in particular before drawing out some, um, some practical applications of this at the end. So we're not going to have time to make much comment at all on these except to acknowledge them and continue on. A lot of these are things that we would, in a written context, call a literary device, but since it's spoken in this oral Oral, oral culture of, of teaching, um, you have to imagine, and again, you can only read between the lines, you have to imagine how tone would impact it as he said it. You have to imagine how a well-timed pause would impact what he was saying and how he said it. You have to imagine how a knowing look or raised eyebrows or something else that is nonverbal and can't really be written into the story easily would impact it. And so understand that there's all of that sort of thing going on here as well. Well, let me talk about a few examples of this. The first one being uh, hyperbole or exaggeration or sometimes what this will lead to, what I'll just call absurdism as we think of this. And I'll give you two well-known examples of this that hopefully you've recognized the humor in before. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking about not judging people. And what he ultimately says is, it's just like if you've got a buddy over there with a tiny little speck of dust in his eye, and you've got a railroad tie sticking out of yours, and you go to him and say, hey, buddy, let me help you get that little tiny grain of dust out of your eye while you've got this railroad tie sticking out of your head. I'm sorry, that's a funny image. That's one of those things that if we don't think it's funny, it's because either we think Jesus was a stodgy stick in the mud, or we've heard the story so many times, we've lost the fact that it's funny. Jesus is asking us either to envision someone with this giant log sticking out of their face, or someone who has an eye big enough to contain a giant log. <laughs> or maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. It's a funny image. In either way, this guy is running around town looking for people to help get dust out of their eyeballs. It's a funny image. So is the one in Matthew chapter 23 where he talks about the Pharisees who will strain the gnat out of their drink and all the while swallow a camel. Another exaggeration that's built on a contrast of the large and the small. And here they are meticulously straining out of their beverage a little bitty gnat while completely ignoring, and not just ignoring, but ingesting a camel. Have no idea they're doing it. The long hairy neck slides down their throat. And then a hump. And then another hump. <laughs> and then long gangly legs with big callous knees and big padded feet. All the while they're going, oh, got to get this gnat out of here. And having no idea that they're drinking a camel. Again, funny image. And that's immediately followed by the absurdism of the next verse where they are meticulously cleaning the outside of the glass while ignoring the filth, including a camel, on the inside of the glass. Again, this absurdism and exaggeration is intended to be humorous. It's a reminder that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees here aren't just stern criticisms of them, but that they were laced with the kind of humor that would have made the onlooking audience chuckle at the expense of the Pharisees as they saw the real truth in the words of Jesus. And boy, it would have made that message all the more meaningful and memorable. 
We'll come back to this one in just a second because there's something else going on here as well that would have made it memorable. But before we get to that, let me talk about ironic reversals of expectations that happen as well. And these are typically, I mean, depending on the context, these in, in Jesus' teaching don't tend to be as laugh out loud funny as drinking a camel might be. But this is another form of humor where there is something that is set up to be the way it should be, but in the end it is completely subverted and you get the opposite of that sort of thing. So three uh, examples here. One is in Matthew chapter 16. This one's less familiar and it's short, so I'll take a minute here to, to read it. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test them, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, when it is evening, you will say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Here is a group of people who are experts in the word of God not meteorologists. And they could interpret meteorology far better than they could interpret God's teaching and God's Messiah. This is an ironic reversal of expectations. Here is a group of people who should be the first to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, and they miss it completely. And Jesus makes that point by saying, hey, listen, you can tell whether it's going to rain or not based on the sky. Why can't you see the signs of God right in front of you right now? Or you think of Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool, where you've got this man who is so incredibly wealthy, and he, and he talks to himself, which is his own kind of humor. Uh, a lot of times in Jesus' story, when a, stories, when a person starts talking to himself, something funny is about to happen. Um, it's, what am I going to do with all my riches? I know what I'm going to do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And he has all of these grand plans for the future that is met by the sudden surprise that however wealthy and powerful Powerful, and however grand his plans may be, those plans are far, going to far outlive him. It's an ironic reversal of what he thought was going to happen. Or the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, where the most devout Jews on the planet are the villains, and the despicable half-breed rebel is the hero. Another ironic reversal of expectations. And Jesus uses this more subtle form of humor to make significant points and to make his teaching more memorable. Jesus also uses wordplay. I'll only give you one example of this because it's such a good example and because it's so hard to, to flesh out sometimes. Biblical wordplay is extremely common, which is great when you're someone like me that likes puns, but it's not great because it's virtually impossible to translate well from one language to a different. It's so hard to capture wordplay as you're moving from one language to another. And this is one that's even harder because it's not in the Greek text. It's actually in the Aramaic that Jesus was probably speaking to the Pharisees here in Matthew chapter 23. Have you ever wondered why Jesus chooses a gnat and a camel? Out of all the animal kingdom that he could choose from, he chooses a gnat and a camel. Well, maybe it's because those were common animals. I mean, bugs are flying around all over the place. Camels are extremely common in the Near East. Uh, and they're, one is small and one is large. And, and camels are better known uh, to that region of the world than elephants. But it's not like no one had ever heard of an elephant. And man, what a contrast that would have made, right? You, you think it's crazy to swallow a camel. Imagine swallowing an elephant. Why does he choose what he chooses? Well, because in Aramaic, the words for gnat and camel are almost identical with one another. There are two letters in the middle of the word that if you switch their order, it's the other word. And so what Jesus says is you strain the galma and you swallow the gamla. He's making a pun is what he's doing. What he's done is he has chosen two animals that not only make the contrast he's trying to make, but do so in a clever wordplay that, again, is going to be strikingly memorable. Jesus' teachings are full of this. Think about the parables. Some of these we've already talked about this week, but you've got this king's wedding feast that the nobility can't be bothered to attend. And so it's populated entirely with homeless people. A king's wedding feast filled with homeless people. That's an absurd image 
in itself. You've got a man who owes more money to his creditor than the entire treasury of the Roman government. And he says, just give me a couple of weeks and I'll pay it all off. <laughs> really? And so what does he do then when the guy says, oh, don't forget about it, I'll forgive everything. He goes out and finds someone who owes him a few months worth of pay and throttles the guy and throws him in jail and wants to beat him up. There's all kinds of funny stuff going on in that story that Jesus tells. You've got a judge who's walking around saying, you know what, I don't really care about justice. But because you're so obnoxious, I guess I'll do what you want. And he says repeatedly, I don't care about justice. I don't care about God or man or what they think. A judge walking around saying this. Again, the height of absurdity. To say nothing of humor and other parts of Jesus' teaching that aren't parables, like a bunch of Jewish people taking their most valuable possessions and throwing it to pigs. Jewish people throwing their pearls to pigs. Again, the absurdity of it all. Trying to shove a camel not just down your throat, but through the eye of a needle. Lighting a candle and then sticking it under your mattress where, where, where not only will it do no good in terms of providing light, but it will be immediately smothered out or set your house on fire, one or the other. But that's what you've decided to do with this camel. Camel. Candle. <laughs> i got to figure out how to use that. <laughs> that's what you've decided to do with this candle in this particular story. Jesus is constantly giving us images to smile at and images to laugh about as they don't just make us smile and laugh, but they drive home the point and stick out in our minds. I'm sure you've heard people who either love or hate preachers because they tell jokes. In reality, the answer to that is not black and white. The answer is how are they using their humor? If they just want some laughs, like showing a meme or a fake title slide, <laughs> it's probably not that good. But if they're using it to drive home the point, not to distract from the point, but to make the point more meaningful, where every time you saw some gnats flying around a camel, you'd think, I don't want to be like those Pharisees. That's good use of humor and teaching. Let me give you one last example of this that we'll spend the most time on today. It's in Luke chapter 14. And I gotta tell you, I was terrified uh, before I, I opened my Bible and double-checked my, uh, my reference when Dr. Weaver in the last hour twice made reference to Luke chapter 14 and I thought, he is about to steal my thunder. But fortunately, he was talking about a story that was a little bit before ours. Luke chapter 14, I'm gonna say that this is a multi-layered example of humor. This is, in, in my view, probably the funniest single teaching of Jesus that I've saved for the end, and you'll see why in just a moment. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I must go examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. The master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and there is still room. And the master said to the servant, go to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. In Matthew's version of this that I referred to earlier, it's the king's banquet. And it's filled with homeless people. And this is a similar telling of this. But something different is going on here because you get the excuses that they give. And it's those excuses where I think you find several layers of humor. First of all, you've got the layer of humor where they have all made a major commitment without having any idea what they've committed themselves to. I've bought a field, so I need to go inspect it. I mean, you probably should have done that before you bought the field. Probably should have checked out the oxen before you bought the oxen, right? So there's a layer of humor that they've made a major commitment 
totally clueless about what they're committing themselves to, which leads then to the second layer of humor, and that is the fact that they're trying to get out of what would have been a great honor to be invited to so they could go deal with a menial task. Understand in the ancient world, basically nobody would have rejected this kind of honor, especially in Matthew's story where it's a king's banquet. They're all trying to get out of this great, great event so they can go check something out that they should have checked out before they bought it to begin with. Which leads us into the third level of humor, which is their response. And the structure of their response is the same except for one. Notice the first one says, and I'm paraphrasing here uh, a little bit. He says, uh, I have bought a field. I must go try it out. I won't be able to attend. And the second says, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I must go try them out. I won't be able to attend. And the third one says, I've just married a woman. <clears throat> Therefore, I won't be able to attend. <laughs> Notice what he doesn't say. <laughs> you can just imagine if Jesus tells this story well at all, <laughs> that there would be a series of chuckles and wry smiles and nudges and winks to have circulated among the audience. And it is, in telling the story, the, and I apologize, but this is the right term, pregnant pause that makes this layer of humor so funny. To which some people would say, now wait just a second, Jesus would never make that kind of joke. To which I say, I don't see why not. <laughs> the Bible is far less puritanical than American Christendom is. From stories of horror in Genesis 19 and Judges 19, the stories of wedded bliss in Proverbs 5 and the Song of Songs, to the prophet's description of idolatry, particularly Hosea, Jeremiah, and passages that nobody seems to know exist in Ezekiel 16 and 23. <laughs> As many of us in the Bible department frequently tell our students, if the Bible were a movie, your parents wouldn't let you watch it. And if the Bible can be filled with all of that, I don't see why Jesus can't elicit a smile or two with this kind of story. So what's the upshot of it all? What's the point? Is my me uh, message here just to tell you you can laugh at the stories? Here's some reasons why to laugh at the stories. Let me tell you some good jokes and we'll be done. No, I think there is something more to all of this that I want you to walk away with today. And as we think about the significance of humor in Jesus' teaching, let me suggest to you just three things to think about. First of all, is that to understand the humor in Jesus' teaching is to help us better understand the person of Jesus himself. Jesus was an actual human. He was not made in all points as we are except without sin, or he was made in all points as we are except without sin, not in all points as we are except without sin or a sense of humor, which is kind of how we sometimes read Jesus. He wasn't so well liked by the multitudes because he was a stodgy stick in the mud with a constant scowl on his face. And again, this idea goes so far back. We talked about John Chrysostom already. Let me share with you a quote from Jerome. Jerome was writing against a uh, ascetic monk named Jovinian, and he wrote two volumes about this guy. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, he says, and this is about asceticism, not humor, but you can understand the analogy, I presume, here in a second. He says, the Lord himself was called by the Pharisees a wine-bibber and a glutton, the friend of publicans and sinners, because he did not decline the invitation of Zacchaeus to dinner and went to the marriage feast. But it is a different matter if, as you may foolishly contend, he went to the dinner intending to fast. Here's this guy that's an ascetic that doesn't want anything pleasurable going on. And what Jerome says is, look at Jesus. He's going around getting this reputation not because everyone hated him and he didn't do anything fun. He didn't go to banquets because he intended not to eat. And let me suggest to you that going to banquets not to eat makes just as much sense as using various forms of humor not to be funny. If we find in Jesus' teaching various forms of humor, he's using it because he wants people to smile. 
and of course, as I said already, to really drive home the point. To miss Jesus, humor is to misunderstand Jesus. And to misunderstand Jesus is to misunderstand his teaching. Again, True Blood tells us an almost universal failure, he's lamenting an almost universal failure to appreciate an element of Christ's life which is so important that without it, any understanding of him is inevitably distorted. He'll say a few pages later, a prosy literalism not only misses the wry humor when humor is present, but what is worse, misses the point of the teaching. Christ taught in figures nearly all the time, and everyone knows that no figure is to be accepted in its entirety. So that brings me to the second point then, which is to understand the humor in Jesus' teaching is to understand the teaching of Jesus. You see, far too often we default to a literal reading of the text of the Bible. Let me suggest to you this afternoon that the goal of a good Bible student should not be to read the Bible literally, but to read it appropriately. And this is true of any document in any genre or any medium as far as that goes in any genre. It's very difficult if it's not impossible to understand something apart from understanding the genre that it's a part of. Can you imagine picking up a science fiction book and reading it thinking that it is science or history and how terribly wrong you would be in what's being talked about there? Or you watch one of these mockumentary movies that are made and you presume that it's historical footage of something that happened, and how terribly you would miss the point. Or you, for some reason, pick up a romance novel, and you think it's self-help. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you don't understand the genre, you don't understand the book. You don't understand whatever it is. And the same thing is true in the Bible. You should read the literal portions literally, and you should read the figurative portions figuratively, and you should read the apocalyptic portions apocalyptically. I mean, whatever it is, understand what you're reading and, reading and read it according to the rules of that genre. And Jesus' uses of various genres of speech means that we need to listen carefully and interpret appropriately. Jesus said... Hate your parents and gouge out your eyeballs. And the general lack of eye patches in this auditorium <laughs> would seem to indicate that you guys are doing a terrible job of applying the words of Jesus to your life. I can't speak of how much you detest your parents. Well, obviously, that's not what that means, right? Well, well why not? <laughs> well, not just because we don't want it to mean that. But self-mutilation doesn't solve heart problems. And everyone is to be loved, including your enemies. Surely parents fit there somewhere as well. <laughs> I hope. You see, there's a difference very often between what a person says and what a person means. And this is especially and inevitably the case when one speaks in figures and in humor. And if we make Jesus a complete grump and we over-literalize his words and we fail to interpret in light of genre, we will miss Jesus' point. Robert Stein says the form or vehicle that Jesus used to convey his message is clearly not the language of 20th century science, but rather the metaphorical, exaggerating, impressionistic language of a culture that loved to tell stories. The vehicle Jesus used to convey his message is, however, not an end in itself. It is the message far more than the medium that is paramount, for that message was and is the word of God. To understand that word correctly, however, requires us to understand the vehicle that Jesus used, to distinguish between the form of that message and its content. It is evident that Jesus thought his hearers were capable of making this distinction and expected them to do so. And it is likewise evident that the gospel writers thought the same and expected the same from their readers. Why don't you just say it literally? So much easier. Well, take that up with Jesus. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus says, speaking not at all about leaven. And when his disciples miss the point, what does he say? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And eventually they figure it out. If we miss the humor... We miss the point. And finally, and this is what I'll leave you with today, a really important piece of seeing the humor in Jesus' teaching 
is helping us to sometimes see that we are the butt of the joke. There's very little that is healthier than the ability to laugh at yourself. And there's very little that is unhealthier than the inability to laugh at yourself. And, is, and is so free, as is so frequently the case in Scripture, we should be able to see ourselves in the shortcomings of others. And we should find there warnings of what to avoid unless we find ourselves in this exact position. G.K. Chesterton said, the only things worth laughing about are serious things. And I think there's some truth to that. He goes on to say in another context that humor can get in under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. You can reach people sometimes through humor that you can't reach another way. Or to quote True Blood one last time, and I'll leave you with this today. Laughter can, if taken aright, have a purgative effect. Humor is redemptive when it leads to comic self-discovery. Christ brings such self-discovery to men who will listen and who will know that they are responsible for what they hear. The most valuable use we can make of the wit and humor of Christ is to think of ourselves as Pharisees, as we to some extent are, and thus allow the comic purification to take place. The laughter is directed at our frailties, but its purpose is to heal. Thank you so much for your kind attention today.